When Dusty first came back from the States, she had two cats, Nicholas, who lived the longest and outlived her, and Malaysia, who was um, killed in an accident not long after she got back. And there was a hysterical situation with Malaysia. She had been killed, and Dusty called me and asked me to come out and help me with the cat. And rigor mortis had set in and Dusty wanted the cat put in the freezer. And we couldn't get the cat in the freezer because we couldn't bend the legs. And she said, maybe we should cut one of the legs off. And I was horrified and looked at her and then saw that look on her face that she, she was finding her sense of humor even in the blackest of moments. When we were doing the concert at the Royal Albert Hall in 1979, Dusty was very amused that the entire f four or five front rows were made up of gay men and women. And she made an announcement that it was nice to see that the royalty wasn't confined to the box, as Princess Margaret was in the box. Now, we all thought that was hysterical. And nowadays, it wouldn't even get a second thought. But in 1979, Princess Margaret sent Dusty a letter, or her secretary did, and enclosing a typed letter for Dusty to sign, apologizing for insulting the Queen. Yeah, she had a shocking eyesight. I mean, that was one of the, <laughs> the stories of Dusty's inability to see, a legendary. I mean, one, on one occasion it affected me because I'd just written a review of um, one of her early albums, the second album I think, and uh, given it glowing reviews and said how wonderful she sounded. And then I fixed up an interview with her PR, Keith Goodwin, went down to Ready Steady Go to interview her, and she was in the reception area and I walked across to say hello, stuck my hand out and she walked straight through me. And I thought, God, what have I done to upset her? You know, so I went back to the office somewhat miffed and rang her PR I said Keith what, what you know what have I done you know I mean she just blanked me completely he said how far were you from her I said about three foot she said was she wearing that soppy wig I said well yeah she was wearing a wig he said well the wig would have been over her eyes you're not on her radio radar at three foot she wouldn't have seen you or heard you go back she's expecting you so I thought oh well I will and um I went back and sure enough, I got within about sort of two inches of her and peered up her right nostril and said, it's Keith Dusty, is it all right for the interview? Oh, darling, what lovely to see you, you know, wonderful Nettie. Go on, come back to the dressing room, you know. She just didn't see people. I mean, she was famously, <laughs> famously, I don't think she was actually arrested, but she was certainly taken into custody for running down an old lady on a zebra crossing one night about 12 o'clock midnight wearing dark glasses while driving her car as if her short-sightedness wouldn't have been sufficient in itself you know rushed out of the car got hold of the little old lady and said this wasn't your fault it wasn't your fault well, i think the judge was unimpressed by the fact that she was wearing dark glasses when it came to the fine at midnight <laughs> and there were lots of stories like that with dusty with her um, problem with her short-sightedness you know people thought she was perhaps being a little rude and in point of fact it was just she didn't see you When she did the roller skating bit, um, I can't remember if it was, I think it was the talk of the town, it was the talk of the town. Um, I was one side of the stage, Dusty was, uh, my husband was the other side because he was also a skater. And um, we would gently push Dusty on and then as she rolled across the stage, it, everything went well in rehearsal. However, when it came to the actual evening for her to do it, they'd move something back a bit and there was a slight incline. So though I gently started her off, she gathered speed and went hairy across the stage. But there was nothing you could do about it. It was the incline on the stage. And she just thought it was hysterically funny. And she, she came skating with me at Alexandra Palace. Her and Madeline came up one night and, and Dusty was saying, oh yeah, I used to skate as a kid. <laughs> and she gave, oh God, did she go down. And she got such a big cheer. It was lovely. But she had a great sense of humor, Dusty. You know, to her that was funny. She didn't mind. She didn't think she's got to look like a star all the time. 
she was just funny. Oh, I've got a pair of skates on. I'll go around the rink. But I thought that, you know, I, I, I must own up. I did panic that night. <laughs> <laughs> the famous willy fiddling incident. This is, uh, it's amazing how many people don't believe this, but every word of it is true. And I have, um, this has been confirmed. <clears throat> and Simon Bell, who looked after her in her last days, uh, you know, knows all about this. Uh, we decided to go out one night in, uh, in London. Uh, it was going to be me, Dusty, Norma Tanega. And Dusty was living with Norma at the Aubrey street house at that time and Peppy was there as well and we were all going to go out. Norma didn't want to come out, she stayed at home anyway so Dusty, I and Peppy went in my little red mini and we went out to a club called Yours and Mine or the Sombrero which was in Kensington High Street. It was a kind of like, um, I suppose it would be a gay club but it was pretty pretty mixed, pretty uh, ambiguous and it was very very in place, packed and it was again Always a big event when Dusty arrived at a place. People were thrilled to see her. So we were chatting away all night. We were engrossed in conversation. Um, we're talking about she fancied footballers. Now this Dusty was on about actually fancying footballers. She liked their big legs. She fancied Gary Sprake, who was the goalkeeper at Leeds at the time. She loved his curly blonde hair and she was going on and on about this. She was getting smashed as well because she, I don't know what she was drinking, Bacardi and Coke or something like that at that time. I was sober as a judge because I didn't drink. And apparently we were so engrossed in conversation that Peppy just left and suddenly by the end of the evening we were there on our own. She was out of her head. In fact, I remember as, as, as we left, some woman launched herself at her and planted a kiss right on her. And, and Dusty usually avoided any display like that in public at all, but she was in a good mood. And uh, anyway, we, we left, we got in my car. As we sat in the car, she started talking about getting very broody. She wanted a child, she, and it was getting too late. She felt she needed to have a child. And she said, if you and I had a child, and at that point, when she said this, she put her hand in um, a place where you should not put your hand without prior permission of the owner. <laughs> and she said, if you and I had a child, it would be a great looking kid. I'm thinking, I was, you know, I was, kind of horrified. This is so unexpected. I thought, well, what if it's got my voice? You know, that's going to be a bit of a problem. Um, and I said, I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready for some kind of responsibility like this. And uh, anyway, as soon as it happened, she suddenly realised I'd been embarrassed. She took her hand away. She said, oh, well, never mind, you know, and we drove off into the night. And uh, it was a strange thing because I, I remember being frightened out of my life at the thought of the whole thing. You know, a few years down the line, I thought, oh gosh, let's go for it. But I thought, this is a big deal. I was, this was Dusty who was talking to me here, you know. But that child, I mean, if it would have gone ahead with the whole dirty deed, you know, who knows what that child would have been like. But it would be interesting. I remember a week later, she had a party at the house for... People like, I remember Bert Backrack was there, Doris Troy, a few other people like that. And she, first thing, as soon as I got there, she apologised like mad for embarrassing me. And Peppy was taking the piss out of me all the night about that, because he'd known about the whole thing, so. Got a postcard from Tom saying, um, Tom Springfield is no longer going to be Tom Springfield. From this point on, he is going to be called Dionysius Plonk. I thought, oh, what on all this, is all this about? So I ignored it. A week later, I got a, another postcard saying, please ignore postcard, Tom Springfield is back to being Tom Springfield. About a few weeks later, I got another postcard from him saying, um, ah, further to the other postcards, I'm now going to be called Dionysius Dionysius. Because Dionysius was his real name. He was Dion O'Brien. And then a few weeks later, I got said, so forget it all, I'm back to Tom Springfield. <laughs> so they were completely mad family. We once went, it was the worst thing ever, the most embarrassing thing ever. 
we turned up at the De Montfort Hall Leicester to do a, a Sunday night concert. And as we drove in through the gates, we saw the poster outside. Now, when you did gigs in those days, you were on with four or five other acts. So we didn't know who we'd be on with that night. We drove in, and it said on the poster, it was Lana Sisters. And I thought, oh, my God, the Lana Sisters on the same bill. So we go in, and they're doing their rehearsal. And they sang Scarlet Ribbons. Now, we sang that in our act. Dusty was livid. Tradition is that whoever goes and does a sound check or rehearsal first, if they do the same song that someone coming afterwards, too bad, they have, they'll get to do it on the show because they had the first sound check, the first rehearsal. So fine, so Dusty's quietly fuming. So I'm standing in the wings that evening watching the Lana sisters on stage, live on stage. And Riss from the Lana sisters steps forward and she puts her hands together like everyone used to do in those days, and Dusty ended up doing too, and said, ladies and gentlemen, it's at this time we would like you to sit quietly and enjoy one of the most beautiful songs. And as she's saying this, this little nudge on my arm, you see, and I turn around, is Dusty standing there. She's got not just one tea tray, she has a tea tray with a set of china on it, with another tea tray balanced on top, with another set of china on it, you see. So I looked at her, and she said, nudge me. And I said, what? She said, nudge me. I said, yeah, okay. I said, stop it, go, go, you see. So Iris just going, and so this beautiful song we'd like to do for you this evening, Scarlet Ribbons. And as she said it, Dusty threw this tray up in the air. The crockery just went everywhere. Bits went over the stage and everything, just huge thing. There's pandemonium. The stage manager rushes up. Dusty points at me and says, he pushed me. They threw me out of the theater. I'm outside the theater. One of, I don't know what to do. The manager, Emlyn Griffiths, had to come and get me back in to do the show that night. And that's the sort of thing Dusty would always do. She loved stuff like that. Smashing crockery, going crazy, going mad. She was... Uh, I enjoyed it too, I have to say, but not when I got the blame and got thrown out of the theatre. But no, uh, she's a funny lady. We'd had fried chicken, a bucket of fried chicken, chicken, brought, delivered. And we'd had our dinner and we'd had Penny Valentine over and we'd had a lovely dinner and then at the end of the dinner, I went to throw the bones in the bin. And she went, oh, don't throw the bones in the bin, the cats will get them. And I couldn't see that they could get in the bin, so. And I went all over the place. I went to ever so many places with these bones and she panicked every time. And I even put them in the microwave and she was frightened of that. So in the end, I threw them in the pool, in the swimming pool, <laughs> which the cat wouldn't get. And that started a mad three weeks. Everything that came in, we threw in the pool. And we even threw, we even found, a pe outside a shop, naughty, we'd probably get arrested, but um, we stole these l bottom legs of a model outside a shop in, in Los Angeles and brought them back and we threw her in the pool as well. So there was legs floating, there was, e the pool was just like something Keith Moon had owned, you know. And uh, people were, com a, a manager, a, a agent came one day to talk to us and we were laying by the pool on, in deck chairs and he was talking to us and his eyes kept going like that and he never said anything, he never said what, I mean if it had been me I'd have been whatever's happened there, you know, but he never said anything, he kept glancing at the pool and we just couldn't, couldn't stop smiling because <laughs> the pool was full of everything you could think of, think we'd thrown things out of the window in it. I don't know what she did with it all when I went home, but it was very much like the Keith Moon, but that was very dusty you know, complete madness. Yeah, and, and because Dusty always knew what would make you laugh, and she'd always like to wind you up, just things would come in the post that you wouldn't expect, so she sent this amazing record, which she must have found the back of her wardrobe, in the post to me, that sort of takes the pee out of her, saying, I'll give it back to you soon, it's a wig, I, we're both drag queens, not just her. It's not real fur showing her, um, love of animals and it's all very hendon isn't it so she's always saying to herself i'm a bit sort of frowsy sort of frumpy housewifey and then you know lots of love dusty just that sort of touch that she would do would make you feel special as well as knowing that she was very special the last performance was 
hysterical. Dusty will always be remembered by her fans for that one. Sunday night at the London Palladium. Bruce Forsyth, Bruce Forsyth came out at the end with uh, three silver cigarette boxes <laughs> and presented us each with a silver cigarette box. It said on each box, you know, best wishes from the London Palladium 1963, you see, the Springfields. And as he presented Dusty with hers, you have to think, this is live on TV. And I gather we had a 21, 22 million viewing audience. It was huge. She said, what's in it? Money? Now, ever after that, people would say to me, God, is she really that greedy? And I said, you don't understand. I said, you can't have any idea. And I said, I'll tell you why she said that. Can you have any idea what we were paid for that show? We're talking about 21 odd million viewers. Sunday night at the London Palladium, biggest TV show. Farewell the Springfields, who've been the biggest group in this country. Until, of course, the Beatles that year. But the biggest, you know what we got paid? 375 pounds, split three ways. Hey, you know, we know there wasn't a lot of money around in those days like there is now, of course, in the music business. But 375 pounds for a show that big, that's why Dusty said to Bruce Forsyth, is, is there money in that box? This I would like to introduce to you is Einstein. This is Dusty's little teddy that travelled all over the world with us. I had to pack him very carefully in cases so that he could breathe and he's still with me now. I can't have Dusty but I can have Einstein and continue to look after him. It was quite dark actually. Um, it, it was more like a play with Dusty's music because uh, the storyline was, it was all about a big fan of Dusty's who was telling her story um, of, of how Dusty her, Dusty's music and watching her on Ready City Go and all that stuff had influenced her life um, from a young girl to a teenager to someone in her 20s who got married and had children and, and uh, so her story was told and I would appear as Dusty as a ghost a lot of the time and sometimes the woman playing the fan would, would talk to me and I would answer her but it was all kind of in her, in her head. It was quite clever I thought and I thought the writing was really good. Um, I, I think the audience really just wanted to hear the songs and, and see Dusty. They kind of wanted a tribute show R really. I'm not sure they were ready for the for the darkness that was presented um, but what was great about it was 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 again was the songs you know I remember when we did Son of a Preacher Man uh, it was a supermarket scene and, and I came um, through the aisles sitting in a trolley <laughs> um, so there was a there was a lot of fun attached to it and we did try and use some of her humour because she did have a, apparently a fantastic sense of humour. I mean I'm just gutted that I never met her really, um, you know, being such a fan and then having that chance to, to play her. Um, but I also had to play her dark parts as well when she was drinking and sort of doing drugs when she was living in LA and that was, that was hard to do. It was hard to do because I'm not an actress. <laughs> and. Uh, and hard because I sort of, I didn't want her to be that, because people don't, do they, with their pop stars and their icons. Um, they want them to be kind of untouchable, and I, I, especially in those days, because we didn't have all these gossip magazines and, and stuff that we do now where people can't wait to see somebody's downfall. Um, I think people wanted her to be up there and iconic and not go wrong. So we all know that Dusty had three wigs, which was Scylla, Lulu and Sandy. It's funny how we all know who those people are, and because and, uh, now everyone's got sort of single names, haven't they, as well, and you know who they are, no surnames, apart from me, I've got one. Um, but I had um, a lot of wigs in, in, the, uh, in the show, and um, I, I'm, I'm not frightened to say that the first set of wigs were not very good at all. Um, the lady did do her best. But um, unfortunately, whoever saw the show for the first maybe six weeks 
probably thought I was playing Loretta Lynn or something because um, I look like I should just be wearing gingham really um, it, I really look like a country and western singer and uh, because all the volume was kind of here <laughs> instead of there um, so I had the, the guy who used to do my beehive who I still see and work with and he still does things for me he, uh, he fixed up the wig for me and uh, eventually um, I did look much more like her um, and, and that was kind of spooky as well that I would look in the mirror and, and think whoa you know and, and my friends would say god it was like her because theatre is very clever with lighting and makeup um, and then Vicky Wickham said to me that I'd started to do weird stuff that she used to do apparently in um, You Don't Have to Say You Love Me which I think was the last song we did like the finale I started to do this thing where I would kick my foot out and people were saying, well, she used to do that. It's like, well, it's nothing to do with me. I, I, it was almost like she was kind of taking me over a little bit. But there was one particular time when um, um, I had a terrible argument with the guy that was, was my dresser. And uh, I had this stage where I was singing The Look of Love, um, it, which had a certain look about it. And I had to run off into the wings, quickly get changed, and come on and do the Pet Shop Boys. And uh, he wasn't there the dresser. So I went off stage and went, oh, some four-letter word, and then ran back on stage doing a Dusty Springfield Pet Shop Boys 80s number in an early 70s <laughs> wig and look. So that was a bit unfortunate. Um, but I'm sure she probably had loads of wig stories, I, I, I should imagine. And I wonder if she was still wearing wigs, you know, forever on. But I liked the bigger the better and the ones with the big flick-ups are my favourites. <laughs>